Um, other announcements is that Grief Share is beginning on Wednesday at the Milford Christian Church for this round. So if anyone knows anyone who is interested, uh, direct them over there. Um, otherwise, we really don't... Oh, one more thing, actually. Spaghetti dinner Sunday, February 18th. The youth are hosting a, the annual spaghetti dinner from 11.30 to 1. Carryouts will be available, and the youth are using this money to help fund the Alaska mission trip coming up in June. Are there any other announcements that I am missing today? No. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Let's begin our worship service today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me now? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come into your house asking that you would be merciful to us, that you would be guiding and leading us, and that your word would go forth and give us peace. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 62. <laughs> Would you rise as we read responsively Psalm 62? For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress I shall not be shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, and I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Amen. Our opening hymn today is number 533 at Calvary, number 533.
may be seated. Our order of service now continues on page two of our ambassador hymnal. Let us now bow before the Lord and confess to him our sins. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are in the sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us your knowledge of you and of your will, and through obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. unconditional word of God says from Isaiah, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Because of promises like this from the word of God, indeed from the mouth of God himself, I have the privilege to declare to you today that your sins are forgiven. Amen. At this time, I will invite you to stand as you are able out of respect for the re God's word. The Old Testament lesson today is from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and put sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn, turn from his evil way, and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent, and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were, were not mourning, and those who rejoice as they as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no, no goods, and those who deal with the word as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of his word is passing away. And our gospel lesson for today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. 
Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Here ends the reading of God's word. God. Now we have the privilege to confess with the church of all times and in all places our holy Christian faith. This morning we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and may be seated. At this time, I will call forward our ushers to receive our morning offering. Would you bow your heads and pray with me at this time? Almighty and everlasting God, 
We are but poor sinners who do not deserve your grace and mercy. In fact, we actively rebel against you every opportunity that we get. But you, in your infinite mercy, chose to send your only Son, Jesus Christ, to a sinful world to teach, exhort, heal, and love on the people he saw and met, to suffer and die, and to rise again, declaring victory over sin, death, and hell, declaring to each one of us the entire forgiveness of all of our sins. Lord, we ask that in times of strife and in times of trial, you would remind us of this miracle that you would impress upon us the forgiveness of our sins and that you would allow us to live our lives in ways that would be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer, that we would be able to love the law of God as it is good and rejoice in the gospel of God which forgives us of our sins. Lord, we ask for the suffering of those who are around us and those who were within our midst. We ask today that you would be with our shut-ins, with Juanita, Diane, Joanne, and Delbert. That you would be giving healing to those who are in need of it, including Gordon, Lenda, Bob, Tim, Norm, DJ, Grayson, Danielle, Robert, Francis, Terry, Casey, Michael, Ty, Blake, Dwayne, and Leslie. We ask that you would be continuing to give faith to the children of this congregation, including those on the cradle roll, Willa, Charlie, Claire, Eloise, Gwen, Rowan, Lane, Waylon, Kennedy, Elena, Madeline, and Joanna. We ask that you would be with those who are on the council, including Tracy, Dane, Craig, Corey, and Stuart. We thank you for their service. We thank you for their work. And we ask that you would be blessing Tracy, Craig, and Corey as they are now departing from the council and tra- or and Dane and Stuart as they come in as they continue another year and that you would be with those who get voted in during our meeting that they would be prepared to serve this congregation Lord we pray that you would be blessing our annual meeting today that you would be providing a sense of peace and joy and comfort with the decisions that are made and that you would be working through this voters meeting that we might effectively be proclaiming your gospel to all people. Lord, we pray for our nation and government in this stressful time of election. We ask that you would be allowing us to take comfort knowing that you are in fact a Lord over all things. For our world leaders and all those who are in authority, we ask that you would be guiding them with your law, giving them diligence and patience that they might deal with their people. And for those who are in the military and their families, we ask that you would be giving them comfort and peace in times of unknown, in times of pain, in times of trial. Lord, we trust your word. We trust your promises. And we ask that you would be working through us, that we might show your love. In your name we pray, amen. Our hymn before the sermon is number 469, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, number 469. You may be seated.
and he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, neither let man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and your word is truth. Sanctify us today in that truth. Convict us of sin in our lives where that is necessary, and comfort and encourage us with the promises of your gospel. In your name we pray, amen. The book of Jonah might be one of my favorite books in all of Scripture. Number one is the fact that it's short. But then also the message of Jonah is one that you simply cannot avoid seeing in everyday life. As we pick up in chapter 3, Jonah has been through a lot in the two short chapters that come before this. He is called by God as a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. He is called, go to Nineveh and call them to repentance, else I will destroy this great city. And Jonah says, right, I'm going to go the other way. And he boards a ship to Tarshish. God sends a storm calling Jonah now to repent of his sin. And instead, Jonah is thrown over, sea, over the boat, sinking into the depths of the seas. And as my kids sometimes like to ask, how in the world can he get eaten by a fish? I don't know, but he does. God summons a great fish to come. To swallow Jonah whole. And as Jonah sits in the belly of the fish, he prays, he repents. The fish hurls him up on dry land. And now, standing at the start of chapter three, this tired, soaking wet, covered in vomit, formerly fantastic prophet of God who has found himself forcibly humbled, stands there. And one commentator rightly puts it, Jonah has been through hell and back. In chapter 2, Jonah, Jonah cries out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, the waters closed, closed in over me to take my life. And as he stands there, God doesn't tell him, all right, Jonah, go get some rest. God doesn't say, see, I proved you wrong. All right, I'm giving you a break now. No, instead, God once again says, arise, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. And as we focus first on just this first couple of verses, the important thing to realize is that the English of this passage is very slightly incomplete. And the reason that's important is that when God declares for Jonah to go to Nineveh, God had already decided the fate of Nineveh. God had already known exactly what would happen. God had already declared that his word would have power to change their hearts. Because the proper phrasing of that passage is that the Lord says, go to Nineveh. 
a great city of God and call to them the message that I tell you. Martin Luther says it rightly when he says, the Lord calls Nineveh a city before God or a city of God. For he has made them, he brings them together, he feeds them, he lets them grow, he blesses and preserves them, he gives them fields and meadows, cattle, water, air, sun, moon, and everything they have as he promised in the creation of all things. And that God here declaring them as a city of God is declaring not only that they are a city which God ordained and created and sustained, but that they would be a city that would bow down and worship God. That they would in fact be a nation, a people who would worship the Lord God of the universe. And Nineveh, as this city before God, has been described as akin to Sodom and Gomorrah from the book of Genesis. It was a city of immorality. It was a city of multiple gods. It was a city of sin. If anyone has ever seen the VeggieTales Jonah movie, it is a city where they slap people with fishes. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Nineveh was a city that by all accounts did not deserve to be saved. By all accounts... Nineveh, that great city, was the capital of Assyria, who was the primary enemy of God's people Israel at that time. In fact, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, would produce the soldiers and the armies and the chariots that would conquer the northern kingdom of Israel 150 years after this prophecy after this message. Jonah likely went to Nineveh this time because he hoped to see them wiped out. Because in Jonah's mind, these stupid people would not repent. And in fact, they would die. In their sin. So Jonah, the reluctant and I would dare say unfaithful prophet of God, goes to Nineveh, that great city of God. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days in breadth. What that means is that in order to get around the entire city, it would take you three days to do it. How many days did our dear prophet here spend in Nineveh? One. Jonah spent one day in Nineveh. The picture here is that he walks in through the front gate, stands on his little soapbox, declares that Nineveh will be overthrown, and then gets out of Dodge as fast as possible. Our prophet Jonah here didn't care about the people whom he was called to proclaim to. He didn't care about the souls of the people contained within Nineveh. No, instead he wanted them to get justice for their sin. Do 
Do you want to know why I say that we see the book of Jonah everywhere? Because this is exactly how we as Christians behave. Because this is exactly what you do when there's someone whom you really don't like. It is the reason why you find yourself getting upset when the guy who was an absolute jerk to you becomes a Christian. It is why we would rather see Russia or Hamas be completely destroyed for the crimes that they are committing against others. Rather than hoping that they would repent. It is why our first option is oftentimes violence and anger. Because we as Christians suffer from the Jonah syndrome. That if you're not as good as me, that if you're not a Christian as long as I have been, that if you haven't had to go through the things that I have gone through, then why should you deserve God's mercy at all? Because you, we as Christians often think, well, I deserve God's grace. The reason why Jonah was such a poor prophet to the people of Nineveh is the same reason why so often we as Christians are such poor people to be around in the world. It is because that unless we feel that they deserve the grace of God, we don't want anyone else to have it. We don't want God to forgive that guy's sins. And we can praise God as we come under conviction of this that he doesn't do what we want him to do. He doesn't operate the way that we want him to operate. No, in fact, for Jonah and his absolute pathetic message that he gives to the, to the city of Nineveh, God uses that to cause Repentance, the likes of which Jonah had never seen. The likes of which the nation of Israel had never replicated. That every single person, from the greatest king sitting on his throne to the lowest peasant sitting in the streets, repented and cried out to God for grace and mercy. That because the word of God was proclaimed there, even by such an unworthy person, he, as a merciful Savior, chose to deliver the people of Nineveh. But the word reached even the great king of Nineveh. And instead of him saying, well, who is this guy to tell me I'm wrong? He tears his robes. He covers himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And then he proclaimed that by decree of the king, no one is to eat or drink. But instead, let us repent before God. Dear friends, the book of Jonah shows us two things. Number one, it shows us the absolute abysmal nature of mankind. That even a prophet called by God so heartily fails because of his selfish 
better than you attitude. And then number two, that God himself is such a merciful and loving Savior that not only is his great desire to save that guy and those people whom we don't like, but that God's desire is also that we ourselves would repent and come to a knowledge of his grace. That we ourselves would turn from our selfish ways and acknowledge that God's grace and love is for us as well. That God's great desire is that Jonah would know his grace. And that Jonah would be able to see. The entirety of chapter 4 teaches us this. That God desires Nineveh, that great city, that great city before God, that great city of God, to come to the forgiveness of their sins. You know what happens in Nineveh that day? The entire nation, the entire city, receives the forgiveness of their sins by God. You know what happens to Jonah? We don't know. Because the book of Jonah ends with a cliffhanger. That God is trying to teach Jonah to abandon his own selfishness and to see the mercy and grace of God. Dear Christian, see the mercy that God has. The mercy that he has given to you as unworthy as you are. See Christ crucified for your sins. And not your sins alone, but also for the sins of all mankind. Even for that guy or those people who you really don't see as deserving of forgiveness. Know for a fact that God shows no partiality. But in fact his desire is that all men would be saved. And come to the knowledge of the truth. So confess before God. Your selfishness. Your unworthiness. And let him pour that grace and mercy upon you again and again. Because it is his desire. No, no. It is his great plan that you, dear Christian, would know his love and proclaim it. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Our hymn now is number 460, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And I will invite you to stand for our hymn.
Now, dear congregation, dear saints, let us pray the prayer which our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 398, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me, number 398. Now go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.